Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining today's live call. I'm Catherine Price, founder of Screen Life Balance and author of books, including that one, and um, How to Break Up Your Phone. I'm, <laughs> I'm so excited to welcome you all to today's live call with that guy, um, Alex Sujung Kim Pong, who uh, is now making me laugh, so I'm going <laughs> to lose my official introduction for him, but he is a Silicon Valley-based consultant and strategist. Um, he's a consulting business, in fact, called Strategy and Rest, and is the author of numerous books that you all should read, including, but not limited to, The Distraction Addiction, and Jen's going to drop these in the chat, um, Shorter, which the subtitle of which is Work Better, Smarter, and Less, and Here's How, and the one that introduced me to Alex's work, which was recommended to me by Dan Harris um, for Good Morning America. It's called Rest, While You Get More Done, While You Work Less, and so Alex and I are going to just spend the next half hour reading each other's books while you guys watch us on, uh, on Zoom. <laughs> no, but oh, Alex, I oh, am hi. absolutely thrilled. I didn't see you there. <laughs> I'm thrilled to have you here and to welcome you to the Screen Life Files community. Thank you to everyone who's making time out of their own work days to join us for this call. And just a quick note of housekeeping before we begin, you can put your you know responses as they come in in the chat. Can't promise Alex and I are actually going to look at it because we focused on each other. But if you have any questions you want us to be sure to try to answer, put them in the Q&A, which I'm pointing at on my screen, but you can't really see it, but in the <laughs> Q&A box. So that preamble aside, today's theme, this week's theme is keeping at it, which is about how to keep fun a priority, even when the rest of life threatens to get in the way. And the reason I'm so excited to speak with Alex is that when I read his book, Rest, I noticed there were many similarities between what he thinks of as rest and what I think of as fun. And these strategies and techniques that he puts forth to keep rest a priority in our lives, I think are very, very applicable to fun. I also think all of us should be prioritizing rest as well. So my hope today is to speak with Alex about what he thinks rest and active rest actually is, how it overlaps with fun, um, why it's important, and then give us some concrete strategies from his own work and life about how to keep both these things priorities in our lives, since it's really hard, but it's worth it. So. Alex, welcome and thank you for joining us. Well, thanks very much. It's great to be with you. So. Yeah, <laughs> it's always a treat to get to see and speak to <laughs> authors whose work you admire because um, when someone's voice jumps off the page as yours does in your books, it's very cool <laughs> to actually get to speak to you. So I wanted to start yeah. by asking you, what is rest and what do we get wrong about it? So um, Let's take that uh, order of take those two things in reverse. What we get wrong about it, first of all, you know, I think like fun, we often think of rest as sort of the absence of something, right? It's like a negative space defined by the absence of work in many of our lives, or it's the thing that happens when work is finished. And the other thing about it is that we tend to think of rest as something entire as you know something pretty passive, right? It involves like a bag of salty snacks in one hand, you know, or of a remote in the other, and the couch. So, but you know, when you look at there's been a but uh, there's been some really interesting sort of uh, research that psychologists and neuroscientists have or of, have done around kind of what the brain does, sort of when we're sort of when we're in a resting state about the place of rest in or of or of in our lives and there are a couple you know and i think there are some really important things that sort of that that teaches us one is that um you know rest is not just the absence of work right it is you know it is its own thing and should be recognized as such and indeed you know sort of work and rest are more like partners Right, the sort of each deserves each deserves plenty of attention in our lives and or of in cultivation. The other thing is that rest is not just passive. Um, the most restorative kinds of rest, you know, the times in which we or of are best able to recharge our mental batteries, recharge our physical batteries, are actually more often active rather than passive. And so you know, stuff like sort of exercise, going for walks, sort of thing is often provides a bigger sort of recharge than doing, quote, nothing, sort of, unquote. The second thing I think is that, you know, you know even when, but, you know, even when our brains apparently are doing nothing, um, it turns out there's actually a lot going on under the hood that we're just not consciously aware of. And indeed, that is sort of uh, those, you know, those periods 
those periods of apparent conscious inactivity can be ones where we are, you know, where we're turning over new ideas, we're having insights, we're kind of percolating ideas un, kind of under the hood that eventually form you know, the basis of, you know, insights or aha moments. And I think the last, you know, the last important thing to highlight about rest is that it's a skill, right? It's a, it's something that we can actually learn to do better. Um, it's a bit in that sense, like breathing, you know, both, both rest and breathing are completely natural in somewhat the same way. I think you could argue that fun is, but, you know, of just as if you're an athlete or you're a singer, you learn to harness your breath in order to project to the back of the, you know, the auditorium or get a little bit more energy. So too, can we learn how to work rest into busy lives to help us or uh, to help us recover better, to have better ideas, to have or more, you know, more balanced and often longer lives. So um, long answer to a simple question, but <laughs> of, that's what that's what rest is and how we ought to think about it <laughs> should write a book about that well so one thing that i that stood out to me what you just said that i think is really interesting is the mis misconception we have as a work being this active state and then rest being passive but you're saying mm -hmm. that that's actually not right it almost sounds like you're saying it's really a difference in what's going on in our minds or where we're putting our attention but i think that's an interesting yes. distinction to expand on which i'd yep. love you to because i think that yeah, the, the idea that rest can be, do, we can do while resting. Can you talk a bit more about that? Sure. So, you know, um, first off, when we, when we just kind of stop thinking about anything in particular, relax your mind, sort of don't concentrate on something, it turns out, you know, it feels like your kind of brain is going quiet. But when you put people in it, in like, you know, fMRI machines. What you find is that the brain, even though we are not conscious of it, is actually just as active as it is when we're focusing hard or we're listening to someone in a conversation. It's just that different parts of the brain are connected together or of, and uh, or of quite or of automatically without our or of conscious effort or attention. And Neuroscientists call this the default mode network, and it's a part of the and it's a network that involves parts of the brain that are associated with creative thinking, with visualization, with um, sort of thinking about the past or sometimes think about the future. But one of the things that it's really good at, it turns out, is taking taking unsolved problems that have occupied our attention and continuing to work on them even while our our conscious attention is somewhere else or maybe is nowhere. So the really simple version of this, and this is something that happens to, you know, that, uh, that, uh, that happens to us or on our behalf a dozen times a day is, you know, you're trying to remember the name of the actor who was in the thing and that movie and the sort of commercial and you can't remember. And five minutes later, while you're doing something else, their name pops into your head. Oh, that was Hugh Jackman. Um, that is the default mode network continuing to work on problems even while you are off doing doing other things and it turns out that so far as we can tell that mechanism is also what's behind much bigger creative insights or aha moments and so i think first and so you know recognizing recognizing the power of sort of that part of that part of our minds, even though we can't control, you know, even though we can't control it in the same way that we can, you know, uh, that we can, we can control other cognitive activities is important. But also, it turns out, and this kind of why is why I wrote rest, that it turns out that this is something that, uh, or that, you know, happens in these in these down times when we are engaged, not in work, but in other things. And it is a process that we can't really ever control, but it is something that we can make, we can consciously make space for in our days, in our lives, in ways that help us have better ideas, do better work, and I would argue have longer, more, you know, longer, more successful or, or at least more fulfilling um, sort of work and or careers.
That's interesting. So creating the, we've talked a lot in these calls and then um, over the course of the fund intervention about the importance of making space for fun. And that's something I touch on a lot in Screen Life Balance of giving your brain space, which is one of the, I think, the main overlaps between what we're talking about. Um, I think that that's very, I'm wondering if you can talk a bit before we get into specific strategies, but the relationship you see between this space that we're, or rather the challenges of trying to protect this space and the technology and our devices and how they might impinge or intrude upon it and how we can possibly protect ourselves or what impact that has on our brain's ability to have the space it needs to be creative in the way that you just described. Right. Well, you know, sort of distraction is a thing that humans have been struggling with for a very long time, right? You know, sort of this is one of the one of the fundamental fundamental insights of Buddhism for the last 2,500 years has been the way in which the mind has a capacity to distract itself and that we have to sort of, you know, we have to labor to sort of to overcome that. So I think, though, that what we confront today are a world of, you know, first of all, devices that have taken that capacity for distraction and weaponized and commoditized it. Right, sort of the we have. Uh, n it has never been, it has never been possible to make as much money off of, or of distracting and redirecting people's attention as sort of as it is today, and you know every time, every time we open up our phones or or go onto social media, we are in a sense going into hand to hand combat against a hundred behavioral you know behavioral design PhDs who are working behind the scenes to tweak just very often little things in interfaces and what we see to get us you know, to get us involved to get us staying on just a little bit longer add that to the fact that many of us work in you know work in places you know open offices for example that are essentially you know kind of carnivals of distraction right? if you were to design if you were to do a space that maximized opportunities for diversion and minimized opportunities for serious sort of deep work, you would come up with the open plan office. And, you know, and then finally, the fact that we are, uh, you know, uh, finally, we live in a world in which it has become the norm to, uh, or to for, you know, or to, uh, for work time, for or to private time, family, for all of these things to kind of munge together. And the, you know, not only is it more of a challenge to maintain boundaries between all of those things, there is an expectation or a claim that it is a good thing to dissolve them. Um, and I think this is actually something sort of, you know, and this is something that has or, uh, that has negative consequences that is sort of at least worth recognizing and acknowledging if not or of you know if not rebalancing in our own lives so for all of those reasons you know ranging from like you know sort of technology and design and the space the spaces that we live in to sort of you know to the way that we think about work and time and personal life um i think that the challenges of of fighting back against distractions, reclaiming attention and reclaiming our time, um, both for you know both for work and for rest and fun, um, have uh, sort of have never been you know have never been greater. As you said that, Alex, I think my husband started our robot vacuum thing. <laughs> for everyone on this call, you know, no, I, I'm going to turn that off so we don't have that sound in the background. <laughs> hold that one thought. But there's an interesting question. Fabulous. Maybe it's about what, you know what? Hold on. Yeah. Hold on. We're just okay. going to okay. multitask. Okay. Cool. I've, I've never had that happen before, but I was like, what the heck is that sound? Um, I, I had one question from the uh, audience I wanted to run by you, um, which is from Crispin, who writes here that he hates the fact that you said rest is a skill. That makes rest sound like work. It's such a turnoff. I feel a visceral desire to rebel against working at being good at rest. Now, I have to preface this by saying last week's theme was rebellion. So, Crispin, I don't know if like I've, I've <laughs> perhaps influenced you in that. But I do hear what you're saying, that I think we have this natural feeling that rest should be easy. So can you do you have anything to say? I think you have touched on some of this, but to say back to the idea that we actually have to work at rest? Well, I think that, you know, it is, it is, 
you know, it's a skill and it's work in the same way that, let's say, you know, painting or drawing or, you know, playing soccer or, of, or video games, for that matter, sort of are skills. Um, and I think that the, you know, it, it, there is there is a risk when you think of it this way that um, it sounds more like work. But I think that, you know, sort of um, there is also, you know, there is also skill in, you know, stuff like solving Wordle. Or, uh, and we need not, we need not experience the cultivation of those skills as things that require, that, you know, either require, require labor in the same way that, or that our day jobs do, nor I think does it automatically reduce the pleasure that we can take in those activities, right? I mean, I, I certainly, I certainly prefer solving the wordle than not solving it and you know the fact that you know the fact that i always use the first two words right in my guesses um and that you know i've got a you know i've got a i've got a strategy for figuring this thing out um that's you know that makes it that makes it more not less pleasurable so i think that sort of you know basically um we need to rethink a little bit or disaggregate skill from work a little bit and recognize that we can be very skilled at things that we really enjoy and indeed, we can enjoy them more for being skilled at them. So. Yeah, I think also it's interesting to think about how we kind of assume that um, pleasure has to be completely easy. Mm -hmm. that, that doesn't really make sense if you really think about it, because the most rewarding things in life often do take effort. And also, as you were just saying, there's so many things competing for our time and attention that if we don't put in the work to create boundaries for the other stuff that can't fight for itself, you know, our rest and our fun don't have the behavioral science or the... Um, the designers, the persuasive design team working on taking our time and attention from us. We have to do that work for it to protect yeah. it. I wanted to get to some um, specific strategies that and, and techniques that you use and recommend both in your own life and for others that help you to maintain the ability to rest in the way that you define it. So can you give us a sense of what some of your daily routines are or some suggestions you have? Yeah, well, for, okay, so, you know, this, rec recognizing that, you know, as a writer and kind of solopreneur that I've got, you know, sort of, I have a lot of control over my own time. And so, sort of, the strategies are different if you've, you know, if you're, if you're doing that kind of work versus, you know, you've got a day job, you know, sort of your time is someone else's. Um, but for me, I think that the, sort of, one effective thing has been um, developing, the de uh, sort of, uh, a morning routine that does two things. Number one, it means that I get the biggest part of my work work day done first, um, which in a sense kind of creates creates both space in my schedule and permission um, for for other things. There are also there's also some interesting neuroscience and sort of behind why it is that working in the super early morning can be good, um, particularly for creative work. You know, particularly if and Ironically, if you, if like me, you're a bit of a night owl. Um, so I think that the sort of that uh, sort of to abstract that a little bit, sort of being conscious about sort of using kind of using work time to create space for rest in your schedule is sort of what that kind of sort of uh, what that uh, of what that abstracts into wait, another wait, wait. thing so I back, oh sorry so, can you go back on that a little bit so it, it expand on yeah, that a so, little bit okay. okay so you know part of you know in a there's a sort of there's a saying in the military that the rest you get is the rest you earn um which uh, and you know and this is this is in like training courses where you know sort of the faster you finish something the more recovery time you have before or if you have to start the next thing and i think that the and for me um, you know, as someone who is, who, you know, when I get into a project, I tend to get really obsessed with it, right? This is, you know, part of the, part of the pleasure of doing the work that I do is the ability to get completely immersed in a subject. And so for me, the kind of my, the uh, sort of my natural, gra uh, you know, my natural kind of center of gravity is to sort of work more on stuff rather than less or to spend more time trying to work. Um, even when, you know, basically all I'm doing is like playing around with margins and fonts and it kind of, you know, there's a whole category of stuff when, sort of when you're a knowledge worker that feels like work, but actually is, you know, sort of does nothing at all except sort of, 
sort of spend time and dissipate nervous energy. So, <laughs> so true. It's so yeah. true. <laughs> but, you know, I think that the sort of that, uh, that thinking, you know, that pursuing a strategy where what you're doing is sort of setting aside particular, number one, setting aside particular times for or for your most important work, where you try to, in a sense, make the, you know, make those as productive and intensive as you can, so that, you know, you can, uh, so that at the end of those, let's say four hours or so, broken up by a break in the middle, because most of us can focus hard for about two hours on something before we need a break. Um, you know, if you can get, if you can do, you know, do those four hours well, then that really, number one, that gives you permission to, or of, uh, to, uh, to rest during the day. And, you know, it also generally means that you've actually gotten a pretty substantial, you, you can get a substantial amount of stuff done in four focused hours compared to kind of 12 semi-distracted ones. Um, so that's what I mean. Gotcha. You know, and then the other thing is that I think that having particular, you know, having things that you like to do is really valuable, right? Thinking of rest as just a kind of blank, blank canvas um, is, you know, particularly for, particularly for those of us who are sometimes a little obsessive about our work or have trouble or, or for other reasons have trouble shutting sort of, you know, shutting off. Having something else that can occupy your mind that is really engaging is incredibly valuable. Right? Winston Churchill wrote a whole little book called Painting as a Pastime that, that made the case for painting based partly on the fact that, you know, busy people have a hundred things going on and it's, you know, and it's not, a, and it's not sufficient just to tell them to do nothing. Rather, what you need is to offer them something else that is going to engage other parts of their brains, but in engaging those parts different from their regular work will energize and refresh them. And he argued that paint, and for him, painting did this. And, you know, it was visual rather than, you know, verbal. Um, it got him outside. It meant actually, you know, manipulating paints and mixing together colors, which was a lot of fun. It was also, in a way, like work, in the sense that in both you literally needed a clear vision of what you were going to do in painting and in politics. You had to be kind of thoughtful and strategic. So when it went well, it offered some of the benefits of what he liked about work at its best. But when he was out painting, he didn't have the Labor Party standing over shoulder saying, you know, or of actually the blue, you know, or the, the sky is a slightly different shade and the tree's too big. Um, and so it was, it was the stuff that he liked, he liked about work when it was at its best without any of the distractions or downsides. Um, so have it, you know, so having things that you enjoy doing is super valuable. Um, sometimes for me, it's walking the dogs in the morning. Um, they rather insist on that. And then, you know, it doesn't, but, you know, it also doesn't have to be things that you necessarily, you don't necessarily have to be really good at them. I have recently. Well, that's important, I think. Yes. Yeah. Not you know, I have, I have recently started doing yoga and I'm terrible at yoga. It turns out, right? Do you want I mean, me to just, do any poses, or are you you're object, okay not doing you know, okay. or to just just imagine, just imagine, sort of doing yoga quite clumsily, and sort of you've got what, sort of you've got you've got me. And the thing is that you know, in my case, I still get an awful lot out of it because just the stretching and so forth has you know that's that's got that's got value at sort of at my age. Um, it also means that every little improvement feels like a much bigger win than or of than uh, than in some other some other areas and you know the fact that in a you know sort of uh, that in a world that you know expects either you know perfection through hard labor or perfection or you know apparently effortless perfection doing something imperfectly and being okay with that I think it's actually a valuable reminder that you can enjoy things even if you're not, you know, e you know, even if you're not going to turn them into a side gig or a second career. 
Um, and so for me, both as a physical break and as kind of a break and psychologically as a kind of break from, a, you know, break from normal expectations, that turns out to have plenty of value. So. It also almost seems like an act of rebellion, going back to our theme from last week, to be okay with doing something imperfectly, you know, to yes. just not care. So I think, I mean, there's a lot of stuff you just touched on. What I, some themes I, I heard you say that I want to pull out are the idea that for all of us, even night owls, there is often a benefit to doing your creative or most important work earlier in the day. Mm -hmm. And that if you are able to concentrate your work so that you're not having this diffuse you know, feeling of being productive when really you're just like fiddling around with Google Sheets to make the tabs look right or whatever. But if you're right. actually doing your most important work, you may be surprised to then find more hours in the day open up. Um, and I would think that might be true even for people with more traditional jobs than a solopreneur. But it does seem to me that that yes. does require some forethought and um, planning. And I'm wondering if you can, like you have to know what you want to do in that time right. and then set yourself up to be able to do it. I wonder if you can talk a bit about any strategies you use to identify your most important work and then make sure that you are able to block out the time for it in this four hour chunk divided up by, because Alex talks a lot in his book right. about four hours. Yeah. So, you know, I think, I think actually most of us have a fairly good sense of what we ought to be working on, you know, what things, what things we ought to ruthlessly prioritize. And it's a matter of actually uh, of actually having the incentive or the or of the strategies to do that. So, um, you know, for me, for one th at the macro level, you know, when I'm writing a book, treating a book like a consult, uh, like a, you know, a book contract, like a consulting agreement, right? Which is to say for me, something that has a very hard deadline that, you know, with clear deliverables and, and that, you know, I am going to make no matter what. Um, is really useful for me as an organizing principle. It means that the kinds of sort of, the, you know, number one, what that means is all of the kind of, you know, the sort of uh, exquisitely designed delaying tactics that I had as an academic all go out the window, right? You know, sort of, it's not about reading absolutely everything before you sit down to write, um, you know, you you know, you learn enough in order to be competent <laughs> that about the subject. All the time. No, yeah. absolutely. No. And, yeah. you know, it feels, you know, it's, it's the, it's the sort of thing that, fe you know, that pursuit of, that pursuit of perfectionism has, you know, sort of has its place. You certainly don't want to pursue being terrible. Um, but I think recognizing that you need to put brakes on it and that at the end of the day, you know, you got to generate sort of the thousand words is, you know, and that you're going to prioritize that is important. The other, you know, another thing for me is recognizing that um, in a sense, when you're writing a book or with just about any work, you know, you're not, you're not creating, you're not building the pyramids, right? Or of, it's more like you're making a good dinner. Um, you know, we want our books to be read. We want our, you know, we want, we want our work to have an impact. And, we should take it seriously, but there are limits to what we are able to do in order to sort of to guarantee that people listen, um, or that you know, or that the project takes off in the way that it does. And I think there's something liberating about you know about the idea that you do the very best work you can, but you don't worry so much about whether this is something that's immortal or not because that ultimately is out of your control. Um, and then I think, you know, as a practical, you know, at a, as a practical basis, I know how I work well enough to know that if I can get those serious four hours, then that's actually a really good day. And if I can do that consistently, right, over the course of several months, at the end of it, I'll have a book done. Um, my first book took me 10 years to write, like doing late nights and kind of stealing time. And sort of working working using none of the none of the principles I talk about in rest following all the stuff that I talk about in the book I've managed to write you know three books now in the time it took me to do one so as far which for me is you know, plenty of proof that all of this stuff really you know really delivers really has value <laughs> Um, you know, and having dogs is also good because robot. it That's keeps you to dog. a routine. <laughs> uh, I'm glad I have my headphones in because otherwise my dog would start barking. <laughs> well, I think it's also interesting what you're saying, 
even for people, again, who don't have the flexibility and schedule that if you really are able to figure out what's my main goal for my day, and then yeah. you put in a good chunk of work on it, and then you're self-aware enough to recognize, and by the way, I'm horrible at this. So like, don't, don't think that this is something like, oh, I figured that. But if one, one hypothetically were to be better at noticing when one's brain starts to do things <laughs> like, I don't know, research Roomba mops instead of just the sucker thing. I didn't do that at all. I have not done that recently. Anyway, if you recognize <laughs> when you're starting to reach that point at which you're no longer being productive, it's better to step away than it is to keep beating your head against it. And it occurs to me that if you're in a situation where you can't really leave the office, you're not gonna be able to leave until five or whatever, you still could rearrange your day so that some of the less intensive, less creative, and honestly less important tasks are later in the day, such as processing your email or doing the little things that don't require as much brain power. So I'm- Absolutely, yeah. In, uh -huh. yeah, and indeed, you know, companies, Companies that uh, that move to four day weeks use that explicitly as a strategy for everybody. And so, you know, what we've mainly talked about is like our own kind of work, right? If you're working in an office, if you're sort of doing nine, uh, and your time is not your own in the way that you know sort of mine is, um, the most effective thing I think is if you can pursue if you can pursue collective structural solutions to this problem like the four day week, then that is incredibly powerful because number one, everybody in your office probably has the same sorts of challenges that you do. Number two, um, there are studies that indicate that actually in most offices, we lose about two hours a day to overly long meetings, to technology driven distractions, to the one quick question that turns into a 10 minute conversation that throws you off track on whatever it was that you were working on before. So in reality, for most of us, the four day week is already here. It's just buried underneath all this outmoded stuff. And so if you can get a handle on that, and that requires doing it with everybody else, or most effectively, then you can go a long way to sort of buying back more time for everybody. Now, so if you, you know, to the extent that you can sort of re do stuff like set aside times in your day for focused work, you can try and push meetings to later on in the day, for example, that's awesome. If you can do it together, then that turns it into like a superpower um, because basically you're all, because all of you can kind of work together and reinforce each other um, versus versus this being a strategy that you kind of have to pursue a little bit on the down road. So, yeah. So I recommend everyone get copies of Alex's books and then give them to their bosses would be definitely something. But also if you've got the power, if you are in a position of management where you can implement some of these or put into place strategies that help people protect their time. I actually just spoke to someone from a company that has, I mean, this would be, hard to develop, but there's ways to kind of work around something called Z, Z, Z mail, I believe. And basically they don't allow people to send emails at nights and weekends. They have a thing right. where basically emails get sent into this purgatory and they don't get delivered. You might not be able to do that officially, but there's actually ways to schedule send your email so that if you need to get something off your chest, but you don't want to dump it on someone else's plate, you can preserve their nights and weekends, which kind of segues into, um, and we've got about 10 minutes left. So if people have questions, okay. drop them in the Q and A, but one thing I want to ask you about is the concept of boundaries. So we just talked about the work day. And I think that one of the main benefits of what you're saying is that if you end up feeling more productive at the end of your day and you're like, you've achieved what you, you identified what you wanted to achieve, you achieved it. Then you feel less of a need to continue working because you can at least tell yourself, no, I, I was productive. Now yes. I've opened up more space for active rest, for fun, what have you. But one person asked when they registered for this call to specifically ask about, um, home, like working from home, where your home mm -hmm. is your office, you've got no boundaries. I mean, I'm working from my living room. I was showing Alex before the call. So this is how to break up with your phone, but my daughter wrote underneath and your computer. Thanks. That hurts a little bit. And then she signed her name as a co-author um, because this is my living room. So yeah, Alex, if you've got any, so I think Alex is also working from home. <laughs> yes, any clearly. suggestions for um, how we can Sorry, create? Just... Oh, no problem. No problem. <laughs> how <laughs> uh, we can create better boundaries if we are working from home and, mm -hmm. and protect that space for rest and fun and everything else that's not just in our families, et cetera. You know, okay, so I think it does require a greater degree of deliberateness about how you spend your time, um, you know, particularly when 
your commute basically consists of moving from one side of the couch to the other side of the couch, right? So I think there is a lot of value in routines that goes unacknowledged. We think of routines as kind of boring, as, you know, there's you know, sort of to call something routine is a little bit of an insult, but, you know, and we also think of them as a kind of impediment to sort of creative work, right? Creative work is spontaneous. It's something that is unpredictable, et cetera, et cetera. In reality, I think that um, sort of routines are a foundation for sort of better work and actually a foundation for creative work. One of the things I think that uh, that is really important is what you started with, which is having greater clarity about, or of, in a sense, kind of sort of daily goals and deadlines. Um, you know, having there's uh, it is very it is very reassuring to have sort of a you know or of to knock stuff off your to do list, to not have it be impossibly long every day, um, and to and being able to you know being able to identify those things in advance helps you uh, helps you better plan your day and then at the end of it having crossed them off gives you greater permission to go off and to do other things there are also some really interesting evidence that doing this the night before can actually help you sort of encourage your subconscious to start thinking about some of these problems to start working to do, on to these to do what the night before so you know making a make sort of making that list okay. the night before um, can help prime or engage your subconscious to start working on these things even literally while you're asleep so that in you know so that in the morning what you're doing is not just approaching these things kind of from zero but in a sense you are kind of harness you're kind of harvesting stuff that sort of that your creative mind has already started or sort of started working on so I think that, you know, that uh, in a sense of, you know, a really good routine starts the night before with identifying the things that you will do the next day. Um, I think that having these, having that routine of those clear times when you're going to be focusing hard, times when you take breaks and times after which, assuming you've gotten through everything, you are now free to go off and do sort of other stuff. That can be really valuable for both preserving or for both and encouraging you to work really hard in the times when you're working and give you permission to you know go off and have fun when or of, or of, uh, when you're done the other thing i mean i would also actually just recommend um this book by rebecca seal called solo and totally rebecca is book, everyone, by the way. she <laughs> is she is she really is fabulous and um, Rebecca is a British cookbook writer, among other things. I think she might have been a BBC presenter and some other stuff. But um, it's uh, but as you know, uh, as a sort of great kind of toolkit of strategies and ways of thinking about working from home, um, including some recipes. Um, she it's a it's it's hi highly recommended. So excellent. Cool. All right. Well, we have um, one more question I wanted to get to before I, I wrap this up. Um, and that is again from Crispin. And which is funny, I met my first Crispin like two days ago. So it's, hello, I guess there's a lot of you out there and I never knew that. And that basically is getting at the idea of like, what is rest versus fun? And the definition that you're putting forth of, I think it's really going back to this idea that the definition of rest that Alex puts forth is different from what we typically think of. I think a lot of us think the same way we think of fun is kind of like the things that we do that aren't work, which also often involves just passive consumption, like watching TV or whatever. I think we also have this misperception about what rest is. So Crispin is asking, he's saying, um, it seems like something different from Catherine's definition of real fun. I guess I've been merging there, merging them. Uh, what's your definition of rest? And he's saying, taking yoga as an example, I love doing yoga, but would not define yoga as rest. It takes energy both to do the actual activity and to motivate myself to practice. And so I'll, I'll take a quick crack and then I'd love your take, sure. Alex. Is that to me, because I've been thinking about this, I think that to me, fun is almost a form of rest, that rest is this bigger world. And fun, as you guys on this call know by now, I define as this state of playful connected flow. So it's more of a state rather than something specific you're doing. Um, but it's a very energizing and nourishing state in the same way that I think, Alex, what you're defining as rest is this bigger collection of things we do that are energizing and nourishing, which may take different forms for different people. It could be staring off into space for a while for some people. For others, it could be distracting your 
your thinking mind by doing painting or yoga, giving yourself space. Um, to me, they're related, but I think Crispin, you're, you're correct that there is a slight difference and that fun in my definition fits into this broader rest category. But Alex, I'm wondering if you can speak to that because I do think it highlights this, and I know we started the call with this, but this misperception we have about rest that it's lying on a beach. I mean, even when the, when the designers put flip-flops on your cover, right? Like that's not necessarily, I think what you're talking about when you say rest. So if we can wrap up the call kind of where we sure. started with that um, concept. Right. No, I think, so I think of rest as the time that we spend rec sort of recharging the mental and physical batteries that you know, sort of, that we expend while sort of while working. And I think that the, you know, the important, so once you think of it that way, once you start to think of it that way, I think it you know, that helps us back away a little bit from the idea that rest, you know, rest does not, you know, by definition involve sort of additional expenditure of energy, right? Or sort of, you know, or activity. That, you know, these things, you know, things, things that often are most restorative are things that actually do require, you know, energy to you know in the activity and maybe some energy to motivate or of to motivate oneself to do them um i think that you know the less you can you know the less you have to motivate yourself or of the better but certainly there are things uh, but you know the fact that the fact that you have to you have to do that doesn't mean that over uh, that this activity is not restorative i think it's also you know the uh, I would also encourage us not to draw a really bright line between the things that are, you know, the things that we do when we're resting that are sort of psychologically rewarding and the rewards that we get from work, right? I, this is, you know, this is, this is something that Churchill and painting as a pastime pointed to. But, you know, when you look at people in incredibly demanding competitive fields who also are like mountain climbers or competitive sailors, you know, they do things that often are physically demanding or dangerous that take a lot of time that they could be spending, you know, in the laboratory. And part of the reason that they do this is that these are places that, you know, that are super absorbing. These are activities that are super absorbing that offer some of the ki same kinds of psychological rewards that, that they enjoy in work at its very best. So, you know, Viktor Frankl, you know, who wrote Man's Search for Meaning, was a really avid mountain climber. And he, you know, he stopped climbing, I think, when he was in his 80s or so. And, you know, like a and, you know, he talked about climbing as the only place where he wasn't thinking about, psych, you know, sort of about sort of psychotherapy. And that he kept but you know it was a place in which he could restore his mind but it was also where he went to allow himself to think about some of his deepest problems and i think that that you know that captures the boat the somewhat paradoxical nature of this kind of rest but also the great opportunity that it offers us to you know or of to uh, to have to have richer lives and to have you know and also to help us do more meaningful work so and, and it also stands out to me from what you're saying that there is a common theme to, if we're thinking about how to conceptualize this sort of rest and then the overlaps with fun flow right it's things that are getting you into flow that are yes. different from your regular work existence and i'm also taking from you alex this rest is things that fill you back up, even if you're expending energy during them, which I think is really mm -hmm. interesting to think about. It's like, what is nourishing you, even if you're actively doing? And I think that really gets to this week's theme of, I mean, we've actually touched on a lot of the themes from this whole intervention in this call, but this theme of keeping at it, how do we keep fun? How do we keep rest at the top of our priority lists? And it just makes me think of one thing that that I'm going to be doing starting now. I just signed up for a new guitar class about the Beatles. I'm going to be going to this Beatles <laughs> class and I've got to put in some work to get to the class to make sure I've got childcare coverage, like swap around bedtimes. It's going to take mental energy. It's a little bit past my bedtime, but I also know that even though that's going to be harder to do logistically than it would be for me to just sit on the couch or, you know, answer email for another hour and a half, which I'm sure I would, I could easily do it's going to be so worth it because it's going to fill me up. So I think perhaps that's a way to kind of conceptualize what we're talking about on this call is what fills you back up so that you then have more energy for everything else. 
And whether you think of that as fun or as rest, or if you want to tease out the distinctions between the two, it's, it should be a priority, not just because it will help you with your work life, but also because it'll make your whole life more joyful and more meaningful. Um, so yeah, so I, I think that's a great place to, to end. Alex, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you again to everyone on the call for making space for this um, experience and this conversation. Um, I'd love to hear from anyone about how your fundervention went. I sent out a link in today's email for the final survey. If you want to take it just for fun to see how you have or have not changed over the course of the month and set some intentions going forward. And um, stay tuned for an exciting announcement tomorrow. I am actually, I'll tell you guys what it is. I uh, teamed up with this company to make a text-based course off of how to break up with your phone, where your phone actually will break up with you and walk you through a whole month so that you can improve your relationship with your phone. So that launches tomorrow. So sneak peek. But again, thank you. Thank you, Alex. Um, check out his book and his other books as well, but I've got this one in front of me and I can't wait to um, hear from everybody. So thanks again. Thank you. It's been, been a lot of fun. Oh, good. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> oh, yeah. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.